So thank you everyone for taking the time out of your uh, evening to, uh, to meet with, uh, with, with me. Um, so I've set up this uh, user group just to help you know, share some of the knowledge that I've uh, uh, gathered over the, over the many years. Um, and so what I'm hoping it will do is for those that are, are wanting to get into um, threat intelligence, um, cybersecurity, um, you know, this is, a, this is a way that you can um, sort of start to dig deeper into uh, some of the things that you want to be able to do and get an understanding of the different uh, parts that uh, that make up um, security, cybersecurity in general. So during this, I'm going to cover some of the basics, um, the uh, threat intelligence lifecycle, the, the data models that can be used, the threat intelligence programs as well. Um, and then cover some of the use cases, the, 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 the sort of the most popular use cases for that, and then um, how you can use that on a day-to-day -day in security operations. Um, feel free to ask questions. Um, so if you don't understand something or have a have a something that you want to add and, and contribute, please by all means um, just uh, yeah come in and, and and ask the question or, or put forward your your experiences and so forth. So more than uh, more than happy to go there. So my name's Tim Peters. Uh, I go by the uh, the name Imposter on. Um, Twitter and so forth. I, I work as a threat intelligence engineer for a company called Threat Quotient. So uh, Threat Quotient make a threat intelligence platform, um, but we won't be discussing anything of, of Threat Quotient in, in this. It's very, very uh, generic in terms of, of a um, uh, threat intelligence and cyber threat intelligence and how it, um, how it all comes together. Um, I'm, I'm I'm a nerd and and I'm and as you can see I've got a lot of grey so I, you know I tend to shout at clouds quite quite a lot. Um, so what I wanted to do is really take you through some of the some of the basics of threat intelligence and in in specifically cyber threat intelligence uh, because this is what we we tend to work with day to day. So from a cyber, you know, what is cyber threat intelligence? And really in, in red here, we've got, it, it's, it's actionable information about threats and threat actors that can potentially be used to prevent a harmful event. So really we're, 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 we're saying that we're using, you know, intelligence or information to uh, help better protect our defenses in our, in our organization. Um, you know, very much in the same way as um, you know, threat intel is used. You know, in in the sort of spy game and also in in the military side of things. Um, you know, it, it's just taking it with uh, looking at at it through a uh, a cyber lens. You know, so we really want to understand what the motives of the threat actor are. What are their capabilities? What are their movements? What are, what are they doing? Do they fit a certain profile? Do how have they been targeting certain industries, verticals, um, regions as such? You know, what capabilities do they have? Um, it, it, it's a lot more than just, you know, IP addresses and, and, and indicators of compromise. Um, and as I'll go through that, um, it will start to make a little bit more sense in how, why cyber threat intel is more than, as I see it, is more than just indicators as, um, as such. You know, we're really looking on how attackers operate. And um, so, and we're looking at, you know, from there, as I've told, in, in the goals, you know, their, their motive capabilities and movements. And in the cyber world, you know, we're looking at tech, tools, tactics, and techniques um, and, and procedures that uh, a threat actor would, would use. You know, there's different types of intelligence. Um, so, you know, there's human intelligence. So, you know, that's your traditional, um, you know, gathering information, social engineering, um, you know, uh, 
building relationships with people to ex uh, extract information out of. You know, we so sort of seen a lot of that. Uh, you you know, if you watch a lot of those uh, uh, history channels and and things like that, you you'll see some of those old world uh, uh, Cold War spy. Uh, games where they used a lot of um, human intelligence uh, and and bringing in to to extract information. Uh, cyber human is 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 really uh, the same same thing, but in a cyber world, we're using intelligence um, in psychological techniques, but in the cyberspace realm. Uh, signals intelligence, which is something you may have heard of, if, if um, you know, uh, within Australia, we've got the Australian Signals Directorate. Um, you know, military have uh, a lot of signals intelligence. Um, can be, um, uh, you know, can it coexist with electronic intelligence? Um, there's open source intelligence, which you may, may or OSINT, which you may be aware of. Um, you know, measure and signature in, uh, intelligence, and then also pizza intelligence. Um, so, you know, we've seen this, you know, this relates really a, a lot to, um, to the US in regards to you know, dominoes would um, be able to predict when governments are about to undertake certain, um, you know, make certain decisions and things like that because they'll order lots of pizzas and things like that. And you can bring that into your own world and seeing how behaviours are um, uh, happen within, um, you know, within your own world. Um, people follow, you know, can follow predictable patterns um, from, from that perspective. There's also different types of CTI roles, so cyber threat intelligence roles. Um, you know, really at the at the start of it is, is you're looking at a threat intelligence analysts. They're really performing uh, in that role. You're performing a collection of information. Um, you're following the cyber threat intelligence life cycle or the, the threat intelligence life cycle, and then you're you know disseminating that information that you've um, that you've gathered and analysed and disseminating that to stakeholders. Uh, whether they be internal or external. Um, then you have your threat intelligence um, technical analysts. They perform some of the same types of role, um, but they also can do things like uh, performing malware uh, analysis, reverse engineering, uh, and so forth. Um, then you have uh, what's called a, a strategic analyst. Uh, so this is someone that's potentially quite senior within the organization and they, they have, uh, you know, they are presenting to executives and boards and they are around what the threat is. Um, and it's not just technical threat, it, it, it's, it's around, you know, business threat and using the, the threat landscape to help drive and that could be to make policy changes, um, to uh, drive purchase decisions um, or to navigate the way that uh, you know organizations behave and then you have what what I what I believe is you know the next level is the cyber threat intelligence researcher so these are the uh, the, the people that are um, out in the dark web they're 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 researching threat actors they're understanding at a at a very granular level about the the, the the operations and the, the tactical uh, approach um, that a threat actor would take. They're, they're also um, impersonating, um, you know, hackers or, or part of forums and things like that. So they are really spending a lot of time um, being, uh, a, you know, impersonating a, a hacker uh, from, from that perspective and, and the threat actors. So the art of intelligence, as I mentioned before, it's about actionable uh, outcomes, you know, and we need to make sure that, um, um, you know, that, that intelligence is accurate, it's relevant, and it comes in a timely uh, manner. And that, that's a hard thing to, to, to juggle sometimes. Um, sometimes it can be accurate, but it, it could, be, could be too late. Um, sometimes it can be relevant, but um, it's not, um, not accurate. Um, and what I mean by that is that, um, you know, there could be a certain uh, threat actor or, or, or an adversary that is um, targeting, um, you know, particular uh, verticals that are not aligned to the, your vertical in your organisation. So that can sometimes um, not be accurate 
as such. So bringing that all together and making it actionable so the organisation knows what they need to be doing to uh, prevent uh, an attack from, uh, from uh, you know, not just occurring, but uh, coming to fruition uh, as such. So I wanted to sort of take you through sort of the threat intelligence life cycle. Um, these are some of the, the, the concepts that you've probably already come across. So a lot of this might, might be um, sort of relevant and, and you might have an understanding of this. But generally speaking, there's six phases within the threat intelligence life cycle. You know, planning and direction, uh, collection, processing, analysis, dissemination and feedback. And they all play a very key role uh, when it comes to threat intelligence. And I'll take you through that. So from a planning and direction, you know, we, we go to set the direction. What is it that we're, uh, you know, what is it that we're protecting? What are the processes that we, um, and assets that we need to protect? Uh, what is the impact? Um, so, you know, this is where we sort of go across and move into the risk uh, of the business. Um, you know, what type of intelligence is needed to protect the organization and respond? You know, you have open source threat intelligence, you have um, geopolitical in, uh, intelligence, you have commercial threat intelligence that comes from many different ways. And how do you prioritize that? And, and this is where the threat intelligence lifecycle can help you understand and prioritize. Um, when we're collecting, you know, uh, collecting threat intelligence, we want to be able to really not only look at what's happening on the outside, but what is happening on, on, on the inside. So both internal and external sources. You know, we, we want to be able to communicate, for, uh, you know, bring in our threat intelligence into platforms like our SIEM, our firewalls and IPS IDS to see if there's been any sightings. We want to get um, industry um, threat intelligence like how particular threat actors are, are behaving, what the, the TTPs are, the, the, the tactics, techniques, and procedures. Um, what are they saying on social media? What are they, what are the, the write-ups about them? Um, you know, what are the, the forums? Um, you know, there's threat actor forums, but there's uh, that uh, you could be in, but there's, you know, within the dark web, um, but there's also closed uh, forums and, and sources where uh, threat actors communicate about uh, potential targets they're, they're they're looking at, or how specific techniques that they're using to bypass, uh, for example, um, you know EDR tools, which has been a, a common one. Um, but then there's also information sharing and collaboration um, through the um, the ISAC communities. So you want to bring all of that in, um, and you just don't want to rely on a single source. And um, just like we do when we're looking for, um, you know, when we're doing our own research to buy a particular product, say we're, we're looking at buying a car, you know, we want to look at, get different different perspectives, different, um, uh, different reviews that we want to read to get an understanding what's the good and the bad, what is this uh, going to be like, um, and then how we can use that information to make better decisions. And then once we want to gather in all that information we need to process that in a way that is um, easy to manage so we want to normalize correlate check that rank it in some way and, uh, and then be able to um, have that in a in a, a more human readable format um, you know for example you know bringing a, a seeing a phishing email we want to be able to extract all those indicators in there so we can make better decisions about what are the URLs we need to block? What are the IP addresses that are there? Um, you know, how do we report to uh, share that information? Um, and we can do that through enrichment processes. We can do that by you know, doing our own investigations um, as such. And that's where it goes into the analysis phase. So, you know, a human, human is always going to be a um, relevant to, um, to threat intelligence. Uh, because 
whilst people do sometimes behave in predictable patterns, um, sometimes they don't, and therefore a human can sometimes be able to pick that up. Um, so, you know, whilst AI and 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 is you know coming to the forefront, and uh, we see that is is that being a big piece of the puzzle. I still believe that there will be a need for humans in the analysis process of threat intelligence um, because we want to know whether we want to invest resources. We want to know uh, how much time and effort we want to put into something and what security controls we have in place. And a lot of that can be automated, but we also want to be able to make those decisions quickly and effectively. And then we want to be able to disseminate that information that we've we've gathered and we've analysed. And you know, there's a lot of stakeholders that uh, that are part of the um, part of security, part of the business as, as such. You know, you have your incident responders, your security operators, your vulnerability management teams, your risk uh, governance, risk and compliance teams, fraud management. If um, you know, certainly in the banking sector and the financial sector, fraud management is 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 a key part. Uh, but there's also security leadership, which then goes and disseminates that information to um, the board or other key, um, um, you know, senior leadership, because that can help influence what is, you know, how much money is invested in security or protecting uh, the organisation and, and the critical controls that you need to put in place. And then that information should come back and 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 close the loop and and what you know we call the feedback loop you know requirements and priorities are always going to change and so from a threat intelligence perspective we need to be able to adapt and respond to the needs of, of the business um, so you know with with the ever evolving threat landscape as as, as that term is is you know quite frequently used that could change the the way that an organization reacts to not only uh, protecting itself and its and its customers but you know how it goes to market how it um, um, you know approaches certain circumstances so how comes in from a uh, from an output a perspective is you know there'll be threat alerts there'll be daily uh, threat assessments uh, summary reports or, or or detailed reports about a particular threat or threat actor um, strategic briefings um, and then um, you know you know what what we call the state of the the threat briefing which is either you know quarterly or annually to to uh, you know the the C suite uh, from there, um, and and they can be you know anywhere from ad hoc to daily and weekly, monthly or quarterly, and they come in different forms. You know they come in uh, as simple as uh, an email. Um, it can be a uh, a report, a PowerPoint presentation, a uh, a word document that is uh, as a report uh, as such, or it could be an automated um, you know sending of potential threats to a system or logging logging tickets for uh, getting other groups within security um, or the business to be to get involved so when we look at what that life cycle sits upon we there's a lot of different models that we um, that we utilize um, within security and, th and these are the sort of things that we you'll be be familiar with um, especially for those are either uh, getting into security you would start to see these models being um, you know threat intelligence models or or particular uh, these these models being um, sort of used uh, quite quite often the first one is is, is the diamond model um, if you're not familiar with it, it's it's a, it's a part of the U.S. defense have uh, created this. It's really to focus on the the adversary, the the infrastructure, the victim, and and the capabilities of, of the threat actor. So bringing these together um, to to understand what uh, the threat is. 
One that you, you're um, probably all familiar with is the Cyber Kill Chain, which was developed by Lockheed Martin. And, and this focuses on reconnaissance, you know, the weaponization, delivery, exploit, installation, command and control and actions. So breaking it down into the, the bite-sized chunks to really understand what, uh, the, what's happening from an attack perspective. One of the other popular ones is the MITRE attack framework. And, you know, they, they have broken this up into two. So there is the pre-attack where we look at recon and weaponize to the, uh, the attack phase, which is the delivery, the exploit, control, execute and maintain, you know, for persistence um, and, and exfiltration of, of data. This is where a lot of the, um, you know, threat intel um, utilize and, and talk about TTPs. Um, they're aligning from, from a technical perspective, we're aligning back into the MITRE ATT&CK framework because it is a, a, a really good uh, framework to, uh, to use. And it doesn't discredit any of the other um, uh, models that I, I, I have mentioned or will mention. Um, it's just one model that you can use. Stride is another model that is, is used. This one was developed by Microsoft. Um, you know, it stands for spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. You know, again, this is uh, this is Microsoft's model um, for those that uh, are in um, sort of the Microsoft camp, and the, they that type of information will be um, passed down in that sort of way. Um, and then finally, we have the, the OODA loop. Um, this was created by a military strategist. It is used um, by, uh, that I've encountered with some of my customers uh, that I deal with, um, but this is about observe, orient, decide and act. And uh, again, it uses that military um, background to understand what a, a threat actor or an adversary might be doing and how then you can approach the way that you um, defend against that. So using those different types of models that um, when it comes to threat intelligence, we need to be able to in, ingest that uh, data um, in, in, from those models in a way that is, is readable. And so there's, you know, a there's, some different types of data models. And what I want to cover is, is probably the main one that I see uh, used by, uh, by a lot of uh, organizations uh, globally. Um, and the reason for that is that there's a lot of fragmentation. We have, you know, internal uh, systems such as your SIEM, your um, network, your EDR tools or XDR tools. Um, you've got your malware analysis, sandboxes, and so forth. Then you've got your external threat threat data, um, you know, that comes from open source commercial, uh, from sharing communities, from industry peers, and, and so forth. Um, you've got your virus totals, your showdowns for enrichment capabilities. You've got your stakeholders. Um, and so to bring that all together, to be able to understand and, and read and, and be able to share that information across all of those systems is is really key because some systems might, uh, and, and groups may um, want to uh, interpret data differently so trying to have a a, a data model that is universal um, is where we would like to get to um, you know, and all of that will come into what you know, what we we'll call the you know the threat operations or the or the platform or the threat intelligence platform, as such. And really, it's about you know bringing in that and grouping those in in a way that it makes sense, um, and and useful. And the way that it, it's done from the, from what I see is is the. Sort of, I won't say it's the best way, but it's it's one of the ways. Uh, but it's it's widely adopted is the Stix data model, and the Stix data model is is really about taking those particular um, pieces of information and putting it in, in a way that then allows 
you as a consumer of that threat intelligence to understand what each relevant piece is and then the relationship that each piece of data has with other other pieces of data together so for example we have a an indicator which might be a, a piece of malware that might then have a relationship with a, a particular attack pattern or a TTP uh, as such or, or specific tools which are being used which then has a relationship to certain indicators which might be an IP address uh, in that uh, or an FQDN or, or so forth or specific hashes that then have uh, a relationship to um, you know certain campaigns which then have a relationship back up to a specific um, you know particular adversary and then all the way back down through there so closing off that loop and that can help build that, that picture for us as threat intelligence analysts to understand what is going on now the sticks data model is uh, is ever evolving so i've got here sticks 2.0 which is probably the most commonly used data uh, data model however sticks 2.1 has been introduced and that is, um, you know, that is starting to become more widely adopted um, within the industry. So one of the things that I do recommend is, is looking at the Sticks data model and understanding how that data is, um, uh, that data model is, is set up and how data flows in. Um, and that can be found at the, you know, oasis-open.github.io. Um, and you know, just or just look up Stick Starter Model um, using your uh, Google skills. But from what we see, there's been a move towards JSON rather than XML. Um, you know, we want to keep things as simple and, and as clear as possible. Um, you know, we want to have you know having that one standard does make things a lot easier because then systems downstream systems, upstream systems, stakeholders can all interpret that data in, in the same way. And then, you know, we want to build, automatically build those relationships with each individual piece of data. You know, again, where we, where we don't want to be is just focusing on the indicators. We want to use that indicator, uh, indicators like uh, IP addresses and that as part of the uh, life cycle as part of uh, our investigation uh, to be able to determine what is going on, what is the threat, how um, how imminent is that threat potentially, um, what are the course of action that we need to take to protect our, ourselves, or you know from a uh, you know, another way of looking at that, could we stand up to a particular threat from a particular threat actor? Um, that is using these particular uh, tactics and, and techniques uh, from there. So threat intelligence, whilst it's been around for a, a, a very long time, it hasn't been widely adopted. Um, usually threat intelligence has, has um, in programs within an organization have been left sort of to the larger you know, your defense industry or your financial industry, um, you know, heavyweights in there, your large banks and your, your you know, defense, Air Force, Navy, um, Army, so forth. However, what we've seen in, in, in recent years is that it is starting to come uh, trickle down. And so a lot of organizations are looking at how do we establish a threat intelligence program within our organization. Now, Whilst threat intelligence program sounds all, all great, I do bear in mind that at the end of the day, we, we, security is a group of people that are stretched beyond on limit in, in a lot of cases. Um, so for organizations wanting to get into, to, uh, you know, establish a threat intelligence program, it's really about starting small and, and, and walking, um, walking before you run. You know, and using using what I've talked about here is is following the threat intelligence life cycle, getting clarity and and documenting what what is important, um, developing your maturity over time. Um, whilst I said that we don't want to focus on indicators 
um, as such. It's it's more more than that. It might be a good starting uh, place for for you as an organisation to utilise threat intelligence feeds, uh, which have indicators that you can then send to your downstream systems. But also being able to develop over time the the understanding of how a threat actor is is, is their goals and their um, their techniques and that they use. So in this diagram, we try to I'm trying to highlight the facts that um, you know where security operations, where threat intelligence teams sit and the incident response teams is that they then need to disseminate that information that they're collecting in a way that is easy for the vulnerability management, the patch management team, you know, security infrastructure team um, to disseminate. So taking those, um, those indicators and sending that across to those downstream systems that those teams look after. So, um, you know, your, your scene, your EDR, XDR solutions, your, um, your firewalls and so forth. We need an easy and, and uh, a way an automated way to send those across. But then we also need to be able to um, confer and, and deal with you know, risk management teams and, and business, business units and, and other teams in, you know, as I mentioned in the banking, there's, there's uh, fraud investigations teams. We need a way to be able to share information that's easily for them to consume. They're not technical, so they, they may not understand what, why you're sending them and saying, hey, we've got a whole bunch of IP addresses that might not be relevant to them. Uh, so you have to frame it in a way of, you know, um, providing those groups within the business a way of consuming that data as well. Um, same goes for the executives and boards, how that uh, information is disseminated. Sometimes it can be from the senior leadership within security, but other times it can be from other business units um, sending that through to the executives and and um, and uh, uh, you know C-suite um, teams. So when I talk about maturity, you know it it is it is a long game that we're playing. Um, you know we, it, it's you're going to do yourself a disservice if you try to um, do everything at once. And so, you know, we want to be able to take the capabilities and the processes and technology and, and, and merge those with the, the capacity, our, our resources that we have and bring those together. So, you know, we can form a threat intelligence uh, program that matures over time. And then how we do that is really by um, inverting the pyramid. And I'll talk about the pyramid of um, pain, which is something you may, may have heard, may or may not have. But really what we're doing is, you know, we're, we're focusing, we're starting out by protecting the enterprise, protecting our organisation. And then we're, we're moving up into anticipating the threat. And this is where we, you know, we all would love to be. But in reality, you know, the initial and reactive is, is where most of us are or will get to. Um, so threat intelligence can play a part in that. But then when we want to start to move into the proactive and, and, anticipate, um, and anticipate what a threat actor is doing, that's when dedicated threat intelligence teams start to uh, make sense. Um, and, you know, so building up over time, you know, especially when, you, when you're starting out, you want to be, you know, the initial and, and reactive, that's what we're doing. We want to be able to automate that process as much as possible, so it's not a burden on us as a uh, as an organisation. Um, and then, as we mature, we will then want to start to move into that proactive and, and, and anticipatory um, um, way of from a from a capability perspective. So, you know, how that's broken out is that, you know we've got the resource capacity. You know what what is that? You know we're all stretched. We're all doing you know more hours than than we should. We're all trying to juggle many hats in there. Um, but then we've got you know our standard operating procedures and our systems and infrastructure. And when we look at our um, you know where we are in this in this 
uh, way we can start to see where we where our um, security uh, threat intelligence um, program needs to start with or or how where we can go over over the short medium and long term uh, journey so putting all those pieces uh, of puzzles together from a um, from that perspective of, of of looking at our threat intelligence platform or, you know, or establishing that program we can start to see that there's a lot of you know moving parts and all the different things that a threat intelligence platform would need to be able to integrate with. And the reason why we want to be able to integrate with, um, you know, a, a threat intelligence platform needs to integrate with, with those systems is really because we need to um, automate as much as possible to not overstretch the already stretched uh, teams. So when you're looking at it from an indicator perspective and we're starting out at the initial phase and the reactive phase, you know, we want to have all of our threat intelligence coming into one single uh, platform which, where it's aggregated, uh, deduplicated uh, and so forth. But then we want to be able to enrich that data by, you know, sending it to, um, you, know, uh, you know, your sandboxes. We want to be able to, uh, you know, your virus totals, showdowns and so forth. We also want to be able to send that to our seams to see if, if any of those indicators have been cited by our seam. Our XDR solutions. We want to incorporate those into our existing SOAR platforms like for orchestration. Uh, we want to automate that into our ticketing system so we can automate the creation of a ticket um, so we can bring in other teams to go and do certain specific things. We want to automate that into our vulnerability scanning and have that um, working together so we know we can prioritize what systems we need to protect and patch because of the threat, whether it might be imminent uh, as such. So we have all of these different tools and we want to be able to automate those in a way that makes our lives easier as, as threat intel analysts. Um, so we're not spent doing mundane tasks we're focused on moving into that next realm of being you know proactive and whilst that sounds great um it 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 does take time and it it's it as i said it's it's you know you gotta walk before you run and sometimes you gotta crawl before you walk um, so a lot of the the there's a you know, some of the main use cases for threat intelligence is um, uh, I want to take you through and just give you an overview of, of what I see as some of the most popular use cases. So if you're looking at starting up a, uh, you know, threat intel program within your organization, then, you know, these are the, some of the things that you could use, you know, a threat intel um, program or, or platform with. And that could be, you know, as simple as alert triage. Um, you know, being able to take those um, those alerts that we've seen and cited in our seam, um, and be able to react to those. Um, you know, we can reduce the noise by using threat intelligence to understand what is potentially a, a false positive, what is potentially a um, you know a malicious. Uh, piece of uh, malicious IP, malicious uh, FQDN, um, because we've got some, uh, we've enriched that data, we understand the context of it, and we can then make better decisions about what what needs to happen. Obviously, the you know once we we are using, we're getting threat intelligence from multiple sources. We want to be able to use uh, one of the use cases is about managing all of that, and you have lots of uh, options when it comes to managing threat intelligence, and you know a threat intelligence platform is a way to manage all of that um, in a in, in an easy and succinct way um, from from there. You also want to be able to grab information from spear phishing um, campaigns that you as an organization may have encountered, um, you know, may have been picked up um, and you asking the question, well, 
how did it get through if it's a known um, you know, spear phishing or, or if it's a known phishing uh, campaign that we've been able to correlate with some threat intel. Um, you know, spear phishing is very targeted, but, um, you know, sometimes if there's, um, you know, coupled with threat intelligence, we can proactively move into blocking those particular sites where it could be mimicking a, um, you know, a, a uh, Office 365 login prompt or or uh, some some other login prompt which are capturing credentials uh, from there as just one example. Vulnerability vulnerability management is is key. I mean, uh, for those who have been involved in um, in security for a while, know that uh, you, it's it's almost impossible to patch everything at once. Um, so being able to prioritize in a way that uh, is directly related to the threat and the exposure of that uh, um, particular vulnerability, or that is then related to the asset that we have in our system. For example, uh, you know, there might be a, um, a CVE that comes in that has a CVSS score of, you know, 9.7. And, you know, that's all, all, all really bad. However, one, is that relevant to your organization? Do you have that particular system or uh, component in your organization? Uh, if so, what assets are, are, are a potential uh, threat, you know, potential to it being exposed? Um, because something that is internet facing has a higher chance of being exposed than something that is internal um, and not, not directly internet facing. So the priority would be obviously to look at what are the systems that are uh, internet facing and, and are there any particular um, you know, intelligence that we can gather in correlation with our understanding of, of the vulnerabilities that are potentially that our assets in our organization have, what is, what is the priority that we need to, to focus on? Is there an exploit? available because it might be a, a 9.7 but if there's no exploit available then it it may be less of a risk to the to your organization however something that might have a uh, a vulnerability a cvss score of of 5 but has an active exploit that threat actor that a threat actor is actively using then and it is on a inter an internet facing um asset, then we may want to patch that a lot quicker um, or have that as priority over something that is 9.7. 9 so using threat intelligence can help us get to understanding what are the key systems that need to be uh, need to be uh, you know prioritized to be patched or, or protected. Incident response, uh, obviously you want to understand what, uh, you know, how a threat actor may have uh, approached getting into a, um, uh, an organization once, uh, once it's been detected and, and you are responding to that. Um, so you, you'll use threat intelligence to look up certain, you know, um, TTPs. Does that align to any particular um, threat actor uh, in, or campaigns that are being used. So you can use threat intelligence to then retrospectively go back and say, okay, these are the, these are the campaigns that aligns uh, to uh, what we've seen. These are the, um, the TTPs that are being used. We're going to go and focus and look at that. Um, we're not going to, you know, may not want to attribute, uh, um, do attribution uh, as yet because that's always very difficult. However, we want to um, use that to go and look for any potential backdoors that the threat actor may have put in um, there. And then in reverse, we want to be able to use threat intelligence to go proactively threat hunt. Um, so we can send, uh, for example, data from threat intelligence into our EDR, XDR tools that may have the capability to go and proactively threat hunt. Um, so, or 
you may have uh, worked for an organisation that um, does threat hunting or may, may have worked in an organisation that has that capability or you can use threat, uh, threat intelligence to actually work out what are the things I should be focusing on to determine if a, um, you know, if there are any indicators of compromise, um, are, you know, where do we start looking? So that, that can help uh, from, from that perspective. It won't do it for you, but it's, it's really about knowing where to start. So, you know, from a day-to-day -day perspective, how do we how do we actually use it? It's it's all well and good to talk about these conceptual things, but how do you use it in in, in a day-to-day -day basis? The way I I look at this is that there's there's two ways. There's there's events that are known, and then there's uh, uh, events that are you can't see coming. So, in this instance here, of, you know, looking at cyclones, you can see from weather maps and and that when a storm is is brewing and you know when that storm is coming in so using threat in, in uh, intelligence can indicate um when a a threat actor or uh, you know a, a particular attack might may occur however from an you know if we look at earthquakes there is sometimes there's very little preparation we have um for those that are living in in victoria uh, that were awoken um the other uh, other day with to that um you know or or, or slept through um the the earth, earthquake um you know there was very little um notice given so sometimes we can use threat in, intelligence to then um deal with the threat once it arrives and that leads us into really the what what is known as the pyramid of pain and when we look at the the the, the top of the pyramid where we're focusing on the on the ttps um, that's really hard to do. You know, whilst a lot of XDR tools and uh, a lot of tools are out there that can help with this, um, again, you know, looking at the behaviours of a threat actor does require that human element uh, in there. You know, using seeing the tools uh, is challenging, but then you you know, starting off in our threat intel program, we can take those hash values, excuse me, IP addresses, domain names, those network artifacts, and we can send them to those systems. Um, so that's that's really easy in, in an automated way, but it's not the only, only, only way. We need to start looking at the top of the pyramid. And whilst that is harder, the more, uh, the more mature we are in our threat intelligence program, um, the easier it becomes to focus on on these areas because we've automated some of the easy stuff um and some of the you know the annoying um things like you know enriching data or or, or so forth we can all you know we we should be able to automate that and no matter what platform you use that should be a um a, you know a common common theme amongst all all platforms so what that looks like is is really you know a lot of bi-directional integrations um between your threat intelligence platforms your downstream and upstream systems your um your um other teams um uh, in there so your incident response team your threat hunters and, and so forth um so bringing that all together is really around um having that bi-directional integration so when something is seen on the scene it is then reporting that back into the th um, it's either triggering alert or it's, it's it's responding back um that it's been cited into threat intelligence so then you can kick off an investigation uh, as such you know managing all that is 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 difficult but again going down the tool uh, going down the path of automating that is is really key in today's world where we are stretched um, beyond capacity. And really it's about creating efficiency, reducing the noise um, and understanding the threat. Um, so, you know, we want, by reducing the noise, we're automating that, we're, we're enriching the data um, um, and providing context so we know what is, what is a nuisance, what is, what is a threat, what is important to us as as a threat uh, threat analyst 
and how that actually um, allows us to focus on what is most important. So when you're looking at a threat intelligence platform, you want to look at something that is, is can aggregate that structured, uh, unstructured data. It can um, aggregate data from you know, internal and external sources. We then want to operationalize that data. We want to be able to enrich that. We want to be able to send that to the system so it can be used and consumed. Um, and we want to be able to be able to um, share that in a way that is in a, in 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 the right balance. Um, so you can and and allowing you to make better decisions. Um, one of the concepts that I I've added this at the end because it, it's more related to um, it's it's a protocol uh, that's used, but really when you're going doing in you know um, security operations and you need to share data, you may have heard of the traffic light protocol or TLP, and really um, you know there is um, CISO, which is um, Center for Internet Security in uh, in in the US. Have come up with um, you know TLP red, TLP amber, uh, TLP green, and TLP clear, and really it's about define um, assigning a TLP to a particular piece of information. Obviously, if it's clear, it can be shared. Um, if it's green, the, you want to only share it with you know specific users within a community or uh, with other people within the team. If you're looking at an investigation, and it might be an internal investigation, um, it might be a um, something that hasn't um, been, um, you know, not a hundred percent sure of. You may want to give it a TLP amber or red because you don't want to uh, have caused an unnecessary um, panic as such. So. That's at a you know very high level what uh, you know threat intelligence um, basics are. Um, you know, I ran through that quite quickly. Uh, however, you know, you, you, if you do have questions, please feel free to ask now. Um, if you want, I can share some sort of. Um, use case in regards to how using threat intel can then be used to um probably it's easier for me to show this um so what i've got here is is a report and it's on um APT 29. So in a, um, you know, when you're looking at in, in performing an investigation on a particular threat actor, you want to have all this contextual information uh, and, and to be able to, to make, make decisions. So you want to grab all of that information. You want to see where it's come from. You want to be able to see what sort of, you know, what are the victims what are the sort of reports or references that have been assigned to them? Um, you know, where can I find out as a threat analyst, where can I find more information about this particular threat actor? Then you want to be able to see um, from a relationship perspective, does APT29 go by any other names? Well, they actually do. So, you know, they can be known as uh, Cozy Duke because for, for some reason, we don't seem to st want to standardize on naming convention. Um, so we've got things like Soul Storm, Dark Halo, Iron Ritual. Uh, so there's all these different names that are pointing to one particular threat actor, but they go by different names based around the, the, the researchers um, and for the organization that has come up with this particular um, uh, you know, adversary name. So you can see there's a whole lot um, of their different names, Cozy Bear, the Dukes, ATK7. There's some, some, some great names that come out of this. 
But then you also want to see what are the attack patterns that have been used. So you can see these T numbers here, these relate directly back to the MITRE attack framework. Um, you can see that there is a TLP white, which is, um, or, or clear, um, which really uh, shows that this information can be disseminated. There may be specific tactics that are TLP amber as they're doing further research or, or TLP red that, that MITRE uh, may be doing. Um, and, and they won't release that until they are unknown. And that could be um, because of um, various you know, reasons, could be because they're not sure from an attribution um, perspective. But you can see here, the, you know, power shells being used, um, you know, remote system discoveries as such. There's a whole, whole bunch of things here. But it gives you context around what is that threat actor doing, you know, and from an internal perspective, you know, I can then go and look at and say, well, do we have any SMB Windows admin shares that are, are enabled? Um, do we have any cloud accounts or do we have any, um, you know, uh, two-factor authentication re request generated where someone is continually sp uh, spamming um, a particular user to reset their password and it might be in the middle of the night. Um, we've seen this happen before and the person just goes, yeah, I'll just enable it, You're not thinking because they're half asleep and um, that allows um, a threat act to get through. So what are our processes in, in regards to that? So there's all these um, tactics and sub, sub tactics as well. Um, and then we want to see, are there any related campaigns? So, you know, this one has a relation, uh, has, uh, was related to the SolarWinds compromise or Operation Ghost, um, any related malware that it has. So you can then start to say, oh, do I need to reverse, uh, you know, reverse engineer this or do I need to get more information about this particular malware to see if our so, um, EDR tool or XDR tool uh, that we're using um, we'll be able to protect us against that. Um, we can see any reports that we are, uh, that are related, and we can also see any tools, you know, PS exec, IP config, you know, what are we, what are we doing from an internal perspective when we see PS exec uh, being executed? Do we allow it? Do we, is it allowed? Um, is it only allowed by administrators? How are those administrators um, allowed to elevate their privileges as such you know and then we you know look at those the, those reports you can say okay well here is here is that report in our platform that gives us a bit more information about that so we can then go through and read these this particular uh, report that was written and then get a, a good understanding of what the threat is and then make that decision, is this relevant to us? And what actions do I need to be taking from there? And then from within that, you can start to see, okay, well, what are the indicators of compromise that have, that have come out of this? Does my EDR tool or a seem, uh, if I sent this to my EDR tool, will it, um, and it comes back with a, a sighting that has picked up this, you know, SHA, SHA-1 hash, what does that mean? What do I then need to do? So again, you can start to prioritize it and, and take action on there. You can see there's a whole bunch of that. So copying and pasting individually into one, what you then, what you want is your platform to be able to extract all of that, put it into the system, and then send that automatically into uh, in, into your uh, whatever system that you want it to, to look for. And then, Visually, you might want to say, well, what, what is the, um, how does that look from a, a, a TTP perspective? Uh, so just going to bring this up. Yeah, this is a bit of an eye chart, but what it's aimed to show is that this, this is APT29. And when, when I was showing all the, um, all the, the attack patterns that this uh, particular threat actor is using, you can overlay this, uh, all of those against the MITRE attack framework using the, the um, MITRE's free attack navigator tool to overlay 
and start to see, okay, well, what is happening here? Um, and from a threat, threat hunter, hunting perspective, um, you can then start to narrow down and say, oh, I want to focus on these because we know that this particular threat actor may be targeting our industry. It's in, in our region um, and has been uh, has actively compromised a particular um, organisation that is in the same vertical as us. And so on a daily basis, this is what you, you know, you'll be doing. You'll be reading and understanding and, and writing reports about this particular threat actor to say, um, and, and bring in the other teams to say, this is what we, we, we should be focusing on today because we believe uh, that this is an, an imminent threat that is occurring. Are there any questions on that? I know it's a lot to, to, to take in. Okay, um, look, I'll stop the recording if there's anyone. Uh... Yep, so what I'll be doing is I'll be putting these on um, in the uh, CTI user group um, web website. I'll have the slides as well as the video. Uh, so you'll be able to grab that from them. Yeah, it, it is a bit hard to see and I apologize. It is a bit of an eye, eye chart. Um, so just getting back to the question, how OSINT can be used in um, use for, for the GRC team. So uh, what we're doing is that, um, so yeah, I'll, I'll share that through the, um, the meetup with the link to the, um, to the site, and then you can grab that from there. Um, there is also in the Slack and in, in, the link, uh, in the LinkedIn group that I'll share as well, but uh, I'll, I'll use every, every method um, to, to get, get that information out there. Um, so from a GRC perspective, um, when we look at, say, for example, if we're doing a risk assessment on a particular system, we can take that and, uh, for example, you know, we may have a system that might be internet facing we may want to look at, okay, from a uh, risk assessment perspective, we could use, look at from a threat intelligence um, side of things, look at uh, do threat actors actively target this particular system that we're doing a risk assessment on? How often ha has it occurred? What are the, the, the TTPs that they're using? Um, we can then say from a uh, from a risk perspective that are the um, you know are these you know TTPs are being uh, do we have controls in place for for these these TTPs um, if if it's a system that has been actively targeted and uh, is is quite you know common to vulnerabilities uh, and and exposure. You know, from a risk perspective, that might be a high, higher risk than the appetite that it, the organisation is willing to um, accept. So that could influence our buying decision in regards to should we be buying this particular product if the organisation that creates this product or, or system doesn't have a good track, uh, track record and has uh, a lot of, um, you know, uh, software development life cycle isn't great. They're not securing, they have poor programming uh, capabilities. They don't have, uh, um, uh, they're not quick to respond and so forth. So that can help from, from a risk perspective. And um, so that's um, so that's just one way. Uh, the other way you can utilize uh, that from a GRC perspective is looking at the threat landscape and looking at it from a, a region perspective and saying, well, in our vertical, in our uh, industry, and in our region, the threat actor is, um, you know, focusing on, uh, you know, the, these particular things. Um, as an example, some time ago, back in uh, 2015, I was leading security for, uh, for a critical infrastructure organisation um, dealing in, in electricity. And that's when the um, the there was an attack on the Ukrainian uh, power grid, and I had to report to the board in regards to what is 
what does that actually mean for us here in Australia um, for, uh, you know, are we a target and, and, and so forth? So using threat intelligence, um, I was able to gather information about motives. Obviously, it was you know, geopolitically motivated, um, using the, the, the TTPs that they were identified, the indicators of compromise, and I was able to then go back and report to the CEO, to the board, to say that the risk to our organisation is quite low because we are in a different in different region. They they haven't targeted any other, um, you know, power uh, or utilities in outside of that region. There. Um, the controls we have in place look appear to be adequate enough to protect against uh, that. However, from a risk perspective that might be low, we are going to continue to monitor to see if that uh, threat actor does change uh, change course and uh, attempt to um, predict whether they would start uh, in turn attack us. So. From, from a GRC perspective, it can be it can be used to, um, you know, understand what the risk is to the organisation, and what the and the risk appetite that the um, uh, and align that to the risk appetite of the organisation as well. Does does that answer your question? Are there any other questions? I'll stop that recording.